an introduction to money and banking in Canada. Every day, households awake, with some, approximately 65%, being ready and willing to work so that they can get paid to be able to buy some of the stuff that they made. Whatever they do not spend, they save in the financial markets. Their savings facilitate investment in capital stock, capital equipment and inventories, human capital, and its application on capital, technological change and adaptation. The government taxes all economic actors, and this revenue, less transfers back to actors, becomes the means by which governments can function, as well as providing it the means by which it can target areas of the economy which are deemed in the public's interest. Through its agent, the Bank of Canada, the government is able to institute policy goals focused on managing the rate of growth of the economy or the direction and magnitude and change in the economy's growth caused by business cycles. Given the organization of the model, the financial system, which constitutes all of the financial institutions, the banks, for example, the financial markets, equity, bond, debt, and forex, foreign exchange, and the Bank of Canada. It is this consortium of actors which becomes the de facto center of interest in the economy as it is the infrastructure utilized for economic expansion through investment and the means by which expansion is managed. Think of the financial system in this respect. If every actor in the world were their own independent country, specializing in that which they had the highest productive capacity. To increase individual well-being would require a means by which they could trade their effort for that of others. This is the role of the financial system, essentially to provide the ability to trade effort for stuff that makes you feel better. As a thought experiment, consider the future effort you would trade to have your current goals achieved. What are your current skills? The current technology that you have at your disposal, and then how much effort are you willing to apply? This will give you your future skills and your future goal. And that increases your future well-being. Then, Consider what you would lose or gain if the infrastructure did not exist to facilitate the growth of your human capital. As an example, I would be better off if I had a home on the beach with high-speed satellite internet and plentiful fishing opportunities. Without the benefits of the internet link, I would have to physically travel to teach this content. Travel reduces my relative amount of leisure and increases the stress in my life, leading to a drastic decrease in my standard of living. Money and banking vocabulary, advances to banks, asset, Bank of Canada, BOC, bank panic, bank rate, bank run, board of directors at the Bank of Canada, collateralized transactions, commodity money, desired reserve ratio, desired reserves, excess reserves, fiat money, fractional reserve banking system, the governing council at the Bank of Canada, key policy rate, M1, M2, M3, monetary base, monetary policy, money, open market buyback operations, open market operations, operating band, overnight interest rate, purchase and resale agreements, PRAs, quantity theory of money, reserves, sale and repurchase agreements, SRA, Securitization, security, settlement balance, simple deposit multiplier, standing liquidity facilities, velocity of money. Money. What is it? Money is anything of value that is owned by an economic actor, an asset that all actors will accept in exchange for goods and services or payment of debt. Acceptability is a key concept. There are subsets of individuals within all societies who will accept commodity money or goods that have specific value within that subset as barter, fish hooks in marine cultures, grains of wheat from 6000 BCE, and various families of cabbages and radishes used in traditional agrarian societies 
are all forms of acceptable payment. However, this is because both sides of the transaction have something the other finds of value, this double coincidence of wants will not occur, and only fiat money, or that which is authorized by a central bank or government, will be acceptable at your local Tesla dealership. Money, why do we need it? The simplest reason to have money is that it allows the freedom to maximize the return on the skills that afford a higher standard of living. A computer programmer can use their comparative advantage in research and planning and organization and management to develop world-altering applications. They then trade with a specialist in agriculture, or rather, a retail middleman, to meet their nutritional requirement. If the programmer had to grow their own produce and the agriculturist had to create their own cloud-based global positioning system, to automate planting of crops, yes, farm tractors are being driven remotely as I speak, then both would suffer a reduction in productivity and standard of living. What serves as money? Very little has changed in 2,000 years as far as physical money is concerned. Then, and now, it has pictures of prominent individuals on it. Except now, its physical value is essentially zero. This differential is based on the confidence of the public in the institutions that issued the currency, the Bank of Canada in Canada. Economic actors agree to use a currency because they trust that the government will continue to accept it in the future for payments of taxes and that it will continue to mandate its use in the economy. Of note, the U.S. dollar is the current de facto world currency, meaning you can make a transaction with it in most parts of the world, making it the most quote-unquote liquid currency. How much money is there? The amount of money in the economy depends on your definition. The Bank of Canada uses M2 generally. It is the amount of currency is circulated by the Bank of Canada the value of checking and non-checking accounts, those being savings and money market accounts, as well as term and demand and notice deposits held in all financial institutions. The latter two, having interest rates higher than money market and savings accounts, but with restrictions on the ease with which they can be converted into currency. M2++ is the broadest definition of money supply and includes M2 as well as Canada savings bonds and all of the various forms of retail investment instruments, such as mutual funds. Finally, M3 includes M2++ plus all foreign currency deposits. Debit and credit cards. Debit and credit cards are not money. They are promises to pay. In the case of debit cards, payment can be between one and three days. Similar to debit cards, credit card companies record your debt to them within three days, but payment can take longer, with interest accruing after one month or immediately if a cash advance. Of note, if your card is lost or stolen, report it immediately. This will ensure that any unauthorized transactions will not be your responsibility as long as you didn't facilitate the misuse by putting your personal identification number on the card or you gave it to someone willingly. Irrespective, always read or ask your financial institution for such details when applying for a card. Also, credit cards improve your credit rating if you pay according to the appropriate time frame, among other factors. Debit cards do not offer this feature. So if you have long-term investment objectives, it will be in your best interest to obtain and wisely manage a credit card. Bank reserves. Banks profit by converting savings into loans. The difference between the interest they pay on deposited funds and loaned funds becomes part of their profit. 
Given this relationship, it is in the bank's best interest to make as many loans as possible while keeping an adequate amount available should depositors require cash for transactions. This is the key idea of fractional reserve banking. Banks are only required to keep a fraction of deposits in cash reserves or with the central bank and are free to loan as much as they deem prudent. The USA has a desired reserve ratio, R sub D, of 10%, meaning that any cash on hand greater than this is excess reserves. However, some banks have desired reserves above 10%, perhaps because of their particular balance sheet structure. As of 2021, Canadian banks have no formal reserve ratio stated by the Bank of Canada. The Bank's Balance Sheet To understand how banks partner with the Bank of Canada to manage the amount of money in the financial system, we need to understand the Bank's Balance Sheet. The Bank's Balance Sheet is a snapshot which itemizes the value of the bank. Here is the balance sheet for the Bank of Chukistan as of September 30, 20XX. The assets on the left side liabilities on the right, and the difference between them, shareholders' equity on the right. Shareholder equity is the net worth or value of the bank if it had to close, sell its assets to pay for its liabilities. Assets include reserves, as cash has value, loans, as they represent borrowed cash that must be repaid with interest, and securities, usually extremely risk-free bonds of different maturity, for example, Treasury bills, T-bills, and CSBs, Canada Savings Bonds. The primary and largest liability of banks are deposits, as they must be paid on demand. Banks occasionally borrow from the central bank and other banks in the short run to meet reserve requirements, and borrow long-term from investors to facilitate investment in technology and labor. No, as a practice exercise, you should be able to create a balance sheet with different values, but using these constraints. The reserve ratio, 10%. Assets equals liability plus shareholder equity. Deposits times the reserve ratio is equal to reserves, and reserves plus loans equals deposits. Simulation, how banks create money. To illustrate the process of money creation, we will use a miniature form of a balance sheet called a T account. This particular form is used to simplify the actual process. Note that assets are on the left-hand side and liabilities on the right. The major assumptions here are that the desired reserve ratio is 10% and there are no excess reserves. Therefore, the maximum amount of money is created in this simulation as given by the simple deposit multiplier. We will assume three branches of the Bank of Chukistan exist. Branch Beach, Jungle, and Farm. A local fisherman opens an account at the beach branch. To be able to accept internet deposits from visiting foreign nationals who wish to enjoy Chukistan's world-class fishing, they deposit $1,000 into their checking account. The beach branch now has reserves of $1,000 in assets, the cash, and to balance the transaction, $1,000 in deposit liabilities as they must provide the 1000 on demand should the fisherman ask. A doctor, researching jungle medicine, takes a loan at the beach branch so that they can pay their jungle worker for the month. This increases the beach branch's assets by 900 for the loan and liabilities by the same amount placed in the researcher's checking account. When the researcher pays their worker, the 900 is taken from their checking account, deposited into the worker's savings account, 
and the reserves of the jungle branch increase by 900. At the beach branch, the researchers' account is reduced by 900, as are its reserves. This ensures that both branches have balance in assets and liabilities. A separate jungle worker who aspires to be an entrepreneur takes a loan at the jungle branch to buy equipment to process coconut shells into carbon for toothpaste. They take a loan of 810 at the jungle branch, which increases its loans and deposits. The worker buys the equipment and the merchant places the funds in their account at the farm branch, which also increases its reserves causing the jungle branches to decrease to 90. This process can go on indefinitely, but we stop here to determine the increase in money supply. From the beach, 1,000. The jungle, 900. The farm, 810, giving 2,710. If this were to continue, it would increase money supply by 10,000, as given by the simple deposit multiplier. The key point is that new money introduced into a fractional reserve system has the potential to increase investment spending and therefore aggregate demand many times its original amount. The simple deposit multiplier. The simple deposit multiplier indicates the maximum change in money supply given an exogenous increase in new money injected into a fractional reserve banking system. Strictly speaking, it is measured as the ratio of the change in checking deposits given the change in new reserves. There are two assumptions. They are, first, banks hold no excess reserves. Reserves are inversely related to loans, which are directly related to deposits. So an increase in reserves leads to a decrease in deposits. And second, loans are spent on goods and services with the resulting payment being deposited into a financial institution, which then increases total reserves in the financial system, leading to a fractional increase, as given by the inverse of the reserve ratio, in loans and deposits. That is, if currency is held in hand, then total deposits decrease, leading to a decrease in reserves and subsequent loans. So, so in summary, an increase in reserves leads to an increase in loans, which leads to an increase in the money supply, and vice versa. Developing the simple deposit multiplier. If we use the previously developed example of Chukistan, we note that each time a deposit is made in the banking system, it generates another deposit that is smaller by the size of the desired reserve ratio. So we start with 1,000, which leads to an additional deposit of 900. 1,000 is smaller by 10%. And 900 leads to 810, which is 10% less than 900. And this continues indefinitely. Using the Taylor series to reduce this infinite geometric series to an equation gives us that the total increase in deposits will be the initial deposit times 1 over the desired deposit multiplier. So the total change in deposits, or increase in the money supply in this example, is 1,000, the initial deposit of the fisherman, times 1 over 0.1, or 10, giving $10,000. Of note, this idea is used to explain how an increase in the amount of available money supply increases the amount of aggregate demand in the economy. Here, the fisherman's deposit leads to a worker's wage, which leads to investment in technology, which may lead to future investment in coconut harvesting and or more investment in alternative coconut uses. The Bank of Canada. The Bank of Canada is the central bank or the monetary authority in Canada. It is the arm's length agent for the government, meaning that, in principle, it is independent of the government to act as it sees fit, but in practice, it shares the same goals as the government. This enables medium to long-term perspectives to affect monetary supply. 
it performs several functions. One, it is the sole issuer of banknotes and coin. Two, it conducts monetary policy, managing money supply and interest rates to keep inflation low and stable. Three, it promotes a stable financial system, essentially by enacting and enforcing protocols in concert with financial institutions. Four, it manages the funds of the government, or is a fiscal agent managing the government's public debt programs and foreign reserves. Five, it performs economic research. And last, six, it acts as a lender of last resort to financial institutions in the event that, one, depositors simultaneously withdraw their money from a particular institution in fear of its past policies, also known as a bank run. Two, it acts as a lender of last resort should all banks face a simultaneous withdrawal event, also known as a bank panic. And three, it also lends to institutions if they are unable to meet their daily reserve requirements. It is managed by a board of directors, of which a federal government official is one. The board is responsible for administrative oversight and management of the Bank of Canada, while the Governing Council conducts monetary policy and promotes a safe and efficient financial system. The operating band for the overnight interest rate. Unless extraordinary circumstances exist, the Bank of Canada sets monetary policy eight times a year. It announces or signals its targeted overnight interest rate, or the key policy rate. This is the nominal interest rate which is used to determine the cost of borrowing, the bank rate, and the benefit of loaning, or deposit rate. These are necessary as some financial institutions are unable to meet end-of-day reserve requirements or have excess reserves. The difference between the bank rate and deposit rate, or the operating band, is 50 basis points, or 50 BIPs. Each BIP is 1 one hundredth of a percent. Overnight interest rate assumptions. This analysis assumes that financial institutions have the assets, cash or securities, to pledge as collateral to enter into a loan agreement with the Bank of Canada. For the duration of the loan, the Bank of Canada becomes the legal owner of the assets until the loan is repaid, with the condition that any interest or dividends paid on those assets during the period of ownership transferal still accrue to the borrower. Overnight interest rate, end of day activities, advances or loans to financial institutions are made automatically at end of day as each has a deposit account at the Bank of Canada. The account is used as a means of monitoring and enforcing each institution's required reserves. Institutions with negative end-of-day settlement balances in their account pay the bank rate, while positive settlement balances are paid the deposit rate, with the objective of having a zero balance every day. This process is only effective if the Bank of Canada has the means to take either side of a transaction immediately. Its standing liquidity facilities ensure that institutions who are unable to first borrow from other institutions with excess reserves are able to meet their requirements through the Bank of Canada. Should it be necessary, it will lend at the bank rate to ensure that the overnight rate increases no higher and accepts deposits at the deposit rate to ensure that it declines no further. These actions signal to all participants, foreign and domestic, the intention of the government, given its forecasts, the direction and magnitude of change in interest rates needed to effectively manage the growth of the Canadian economy. COVID-19 Addendum to the Overnight Interest Rate As of March 23, 2020, the Bank of Canada has instituted increased settlement balances, although no specific level is targeted. 
that is, no specific desired reserve ratio exists, but institutions have apparently been directed to increase their perceived desired reserves. Additionally, the operating band has been narrowed to 25 basis points, and the deposit rate is being set to the current target for the overnight rate. Monetary policy implementation. The Bank of Canada manages interest rates and monetary policy using two policy tools. One, lending to financial institutions. Two, open market operations. Lending occurs when financial institutions lack reserves at end of day or during a panic. This latter event and those leading to it decrease confidence in the financial system and are avoided at all cost. Open market operations or the buying and selling of government securities have been the primary tool of worldwide monetary policy. Should the Bank of Canada wish to decrease the overnight rate because there is upward pressure on the target rate, they buy securities from financial institutions using PRAs, purchase and resale agreements. The cash that the institutions receive increases their reserves. This affords them the opportunity to make more loans, which translates into an increase in deposits and money supply. And vice versa, with sale and repurchase agreements being the means by which money supply is reduced when there is downward pressure on interest rates. Open Market Operation Attributes the Bank of Canada uses open market operations for three reasons. One, the volume of transactions is controlled, which facilitates required money supply variance. Two, the size of transactions can be varied, facilitating varying degrees of responses to market conditions. And three, no delays exist because institutions carry deposits and securities with the Bank of Canada. Monetary policy objectives. The recent past, notwithstanding, there have been two scenarios which have led to variation in monetary policy. One, the likelihood of recession. A downturn in the economy, usually attributed to lack of aggregate demand, usually results in the Bank of Canada increasing money supply so as to reduce interest rates via a lowering of the target and operating band of the overnight interest rate. The reduction in interest rates increases investment, which ultimately leads to increases in consumption via increased jobs and productivity. The devalued dollar decreases the cost of exports, increasing them, and increases the cost of imports, decreasing them, with a net increase in net exports. Together, this increases aggregate demand, which stabilizes downward pressure on prices due to the increased unemployment of recession, and eventually leads to inflation in the long run as suppliers integrate new inflation expectations into their production forecasts, with the opposite being true when the economy is overheating or overexpanding. The quantity theory of money to Irving Fisher of Yale. It states that money supply multiplied by the average number of times each dollar of money supply is spent, the velocity, is equal to the price level times real output. As of Q2 in 2020, the velocity reached a modern low of 1.103 in the United States after having decreased steadily since Q2 1997. The ideas gained from the theory provide useful insights, which is usually the best that can be achieved. Fisher hypothesized that velocity does not change, and this leads to the following mathematical adjustment to the equation. The inflation rate, or the growth in price levels, is equal to the growth of money supply minus the growth of real output. This implies that growth in money supply is directly related to inflation. Obviously, this has not been the case over the past 30 years. Velocity has steadily decreased. 
However, the ideas gained from the theory provide useful insights, which is usually the best that can be achieved. And they are, if the growth in money supply is greater than the growth in real GDP, the economy experiences inflation. If the growth in money supply is less than the growth of real GDP, it's a deflationary environment. And if the growth of money supply equals the growth in real GDP, prices are stable. Money and Banking Summary Money is generally the good for which you trade your effort, so as to be able to purchase other goods and services at a minimum of transactional cost in the future. That makes money convenient. And better yet, it allows us to specialize our productive capacity because we're always able to trade our productive capacity, our specialized output for money, and then we're able to use that money to buy someone else's specialized output. And this ultimately saves us time, and therefore it affords us more leisure, which ultimately increases our standard of living.